my face is slammed against the wall and I still hear him every single day in my mind. I still hear him saying, is this how you want it as one? Is this how you want it? Being treated less than dirt. When that experience of leadership, when that hit me, that I mean, I, I said all the time, they locked me up in football uh, jail because I just loved the, I loved the camaraderie. I loved my teammates. I appreciate them so much. One of your key takeaways in your teamwork talk is how to emerge as a leader in a hostile environment. And I wanted to make sure I asked you this, like, what do you mean by a hostile environment? If you show that, I guarantee no one's just going to walk out on you and leave you with a, an open position. And welcome back to the show, everyone. My name is Brian Elam. I will be your host here on Get Your Entrepreneurship Together. And today, we have a very special guest, as one Crookshank is here with us. Now, this man focuses on leadership, focuses on building a cohesive team inside of your business. He is a trainer. He's a coach. He's a public speaker. I have no doubt that we're going to have a great time today and you're going to get some great value. So as one, thank you so much for coming on, man. My pleasure and very, very well pronunciation of the name. So kudos to you. Well, I appreciate it. I, I might have had a little help. I'm, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> so before we dive into all of the, the goodness and your wealth of experience in the, the business world, I want to go back and um, just like you checked out a little bit of my stuff, I watched a little bit of your stuff as well. And you had an interview with a Dr. Andy recently. Mm -hmm. And he said something about that maybe he might have had some bullying in his past. And you were very empathetic with that. And mm -hmm. I know that, that kind of empathy doesn't come from just trying to be nice. So right. if you could, what, what happened? Like, how was your childhood and how, how did that influence the journey to where you are right now? Yeah, so first of all, we got to document and break down. Bullying is not just a physical thing. Bullying is a lot mental. So a lot like we had, we were kind of saying this tongue in cheek before we started recording, but when you're growing up and you have a name like Aswan Crookshank, you're going to get the, hey, what are you, just a magical ass? And you, you, know, you have ass this too. You know, you're going to get it a lot in terms of the teasing of your peers. Now, luckily, I found the game of football, and that's where I had received my acceptance. But once those pads came off, I was just that black kid, and I you know, I went to a predominantly white high school, right? So just to kind of give you some more context here, I spent my from K all the way through eight in a school that was predominantly African-American and Hispanic, and I was getting teased there, you know, but again, I played football, and I could kind of brush it off. But when I got recruited to play for the high school that I played for, this was a predominantly Caucasian school. And most of the people that were African-American males that went there, we were on the football team. So it was a culture shock. Again, it's something that I would not trade for the world because it helped develop my mindset. It helped me get comfortable around and just realize that, you know, race and ethnicity and all that stuff. We didn't have to deal with that. And I was exposed to it. But there was a situation in when I was a sophomore there. And I was... The reason I, then I'm, first of all, thank you for listening and being so empathetic yourself for listening. But the reason I resonated with him so much is because I had an experience in which I was bullied, like physically bullied by two administrators of the school. All right. I was my sophomore year in high school and I had just left the wrestling team. So I wasn't the football player, right? I was just, I just finished a, an undefeated JV season. I was a captain on that team and I finally found my place of acceptance. I finally found a place in which I'm like, okay, I belong at Good Council High School, right? So it was, the season was over and I was just a regular student at this point. And it's cold. We were just talking about this. This is wrestling season. This is like in the middle of winter and the athletic trainer, the administrator, athletic trainer, whatever you want to call her, she, uh, we we're waiting, it's the end of school, and we we're waiting to go home. My father would come and pick me up. And she, you know, again, I was a very reserved kid. And this is why it, it pisses me off even to this day when I kind of re, re, uh, regurgitate the entire story. But she comes at me. I'm, I'm standing by myself, Brian. And she comes at me and she tells me to go wait outside. I'm like, 
not waiting outside in 20 degree weather. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm by myself. I'm not making any noise. Now, again, she had had a situation where she was going at it with some of the other students, but I'm not doing that. I respond with just the, the same kind of agitation that I just gave you. I'm not waiting outside. And before I knew it, she grabs my jacket so hard. I could feel the, the, the strings on my, my uh, sleeve pulling. She grabs my jacket and she's trying to drape me up the steps. And she had a colleague who was a male who I thought in my mind was coming to calm her down. Like, this is some serious shit. Are, are, are we allowed to swear on this, by the way? Yep, I can I can put the uh, the explicit warning on there. It's all good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, because this story, it's, it's hard to tell the story without mentioning a few swear words here and there. But uh, so I thought he was coming to calm her down because this is really a serious thing. I'm a teacher now. You put your hands on students. This is not something that is going to be okay. And instead of doing that, he actually helps her, helps her to the point where I'm you know, face, my face is slammed against the wall and I still hear him every single day in my mind. I still hear him saying, is this how you want it as one? Is this how you want it? Being treated less than dirt, draped into the principal's office and thrown in there. And to the point where it got to the point where me and them were having such a shouting match that by the time my dad called me, I'm in the phone, I'm on the phone crying tears of anger. And, you know, he comes in and the situation, basically the way the situation ended was it kind of got settled till Monday and they, they were never fired. They were kind of given, in my opinion, a slap on the wrist. Um, but we did have a principal, we did have a meeting with the principal. And this is why I'm, I'm so forever grateful to my coach, Coach Bob Malloy, who retired. He retired right before I actually moved to Florida. He retired with the most wins of any high school football coach. And I tell people all the time because it was how empathetic he was. It was my mother who was getting really tired of the administrator is coming at me because it wasn't just these two trainers. The next day I was approached by the strength coach and was told, you know, you don't need to be rude to the trainers and all that other bullshit. And my mother calls coach Malloy and she says, look, go to the principal. If they want to keep messing with you, go to the principal. So we went to the principal and I was, you know, I, again, I, I still felt like the punishment wasn't as strong. However, just having that dialogue with coach Malloy, having my parents with the principal and having that conversation I resonate with people like Andy who who got a stapler thrown. And just for you listeners, the, the story you're referring to when it comes to Andy is he had a stapler thrown in his face during work. <laughs> you know, he's in work and he gets a stapler thrown to thrown at his face by his boss. So the empathy that you heard is something that when you're out there working, you're out there, whether it's, you know, just wanting to do something positive, you're going to make folks be very threatened to feel very threatened by I don't know your work ethic, the way you want to put your head down, your work, your blue collar mentality. You, you got to figure out how to to rise above it, and you know just show them, show them what I call integrity. So, take me back to that moment again, just real quick, when you had that you had that teacher or that administrator that you, that you thought was coming to help you because of the injustice, really, that was happening to you. You thought they were coming to help, but really they were just going to pile on, like. What did that do to your mental state at that point? Did you did you just kind of give up and go with it, or did something else happen? Or how did that affect you? Yeah. So like uh, the the initial the initial thing that happened is you go with it because you're a kid, very obedient kid, kid like myself. I was not uh, I was not disruptive in class. I was not the one out there drinking and smoking and, and doing just the negative things. I was not that kid at all. All right. Uh, so what it did over time, again, is it scares you, it bothers you, and it, it creeps into your mental work to where you recognize that authority is going to be threatened by work ethic, authority is going to be threatened by some of the ways you carry yourself, you know, having the ability to just be, you know, productive is going to make it so people who are sort of holding the reins are going to feel threatened because there are tons of administrators out there like that. Even in my adult years, they don't, they're not going to put their hands on you, but they're going to do certain things to hold you back because of how threatened they may feel. Oh. I could definitely see how that could be the case. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you came through that obviously, and, you know, using football as a very healthy way, to understand how to interact with people, people of all races, ethnicities, backgrounds. It doesn't matter when you're on the field, right? Mm -hmm. And is that where you got your first 
taste of being a leader yourself, or did that happen in another instance in another place? That is 1000% the first place I got the first taste of leadership because I was, again, you're, you're speaking to someone as Juan Cruikshank. I was not accepted in the school system per se. So when my teammates, when I had teammates that voted me captain, not only when I was a kid, but as that continued, even in my high school years at a predominantly white institution, when that experience of leadership, when that hit me, that I mean, I, I said all the time, they locked me up in football uh, jail because I just loved the I loved the camaraderie. I loved my teammates. I appreciate them so much for giving me this honor. And just so we're clear. I was not a crazy talented player. I was at, above average at best, but I went to a good council. And right now we put out players in the NFL, like we put out more players in the NFL than some colleges. So these were talented. This is a talented football program. I was not that. I was a just, again, probably an above average talent wise player that worked his ass off to get everything, everything I actually got. So. And was that it? Was that what they saw in you was just this insane work ethic? And that's why they wanted to to have you in that position? Or was it something else? Yeah, it was the insane work ethic. And it was it was probably a lot of the reserve I had by being humbled. Uh, so again, another story, and I'm glad you referred to, to Andy Neely's interview, because one of the things that actually caught his attention was when I was nine years old and I watched my coach, he died on the field. You know, we were nine years old and we were in the middle of a playoff game. And this was the first time, you know, again, the, the youth program I played for was the White Oak Warriors and the majority of kids, we were mostly black kids, right? So the year before we had a, a completely terrible year and they brought in our first ever, at least at least to my knowledge, the first other ever, ever, ever white coach. His name was Coach Art. And he brought an official feel to the program because the majority of the times you turn on the TV, the majority of the coaches for football, they're white men. So this Coach Art guy is like, okay, we're official now. And we were a little more receptive to Coach Art. So we were in the middle of a playoff game against a team that we had previously lost to. And we're getting ready to beat him. And he's giving us a hand. He's like, look, guys, I told you you can do it. I told you you can do it. I told you you can do it. And, you know, Brian, the next thing I knew, we were being rushed off the field because he was having a massive heart attack. And he ended up passing away on this field. So, you know, seeing that as a nine-year-old kid, I mean, images of him struggling for his breath planted right here in my skull, seeing that. It, it shook me. So to answer your question, what what my teammates and probably saw in me was how serious I take this game and how serious I just don't take life for granted when I experience this kind of stuff. And when it comes to I actually was in fact, I was a captain on that team as well. Now that I'm thinking about it when it comes to what I take away from that. My appreciation is like I have to pay it forward. I have to go out and teach other owners how to create that cohesive togetherness within their organization because what I've learned as I've stopped playing is I've learned that adults we get away from that you know what I'm saying we get away from that teamwork element we get away from it and we get our own agendas we only focus in on our own marriages and our own families and our own paychecks and our own whatever situation and we get away from just having an empathetic conversation with somebody new and creating that unit to where you guys go out together and let's go, let's go dominate. Let's whatever the domination may be in your industry, whether you, if you're at McDonald's and you want to dominate Wendy's, I don't give a shit, you know, make sure you guys are working together, you know, make sure you're working together and create that experience for people because that's what we need nowadays. We have these technological devices that keep us in insulated, that keep us by ourselves and we not, we don't have that human to human connection anymore like it used to be. So uh, that, that's the part I, I truly just talking about it, you know, makes me want to go back, put some pads on baby and, you know, get to get, get one more in, man, get one more, <laughs> get a couple more runs in baby. Yeah. I can hear it. I can hear the passion in your voice start to, to elevate when you talk about that. Yeah. I, I, I feel it. I see it. It's awesome. It's awesome, right. dude. So you you started going down exactly the, the the way that I wanted to, which I love it when this happens because I wanted to talk about this idea of creating a cohesive team in the workplace. Now, in your opinion or in your experience, is there a difference between a cohesive team and employees that come in, they do their job, 
they get it done and then they just go home. Is there a difference between those two? A huge difference. Absolutely a huge difference. And and the difference, it starts with leadership. You know, it starts right there with why the person who's in charge is in their position. Okay. You have to set the tone as a leader that you believe in the services and you believe in the products that you offer. All right. And I, I'll give you an example. I, I, there was a manager I had when I worked in an LA fitness, love them to death, love them to death. So if you're listening, please don't take this the wrong way, but it was clear. It was clear based on the way LA fitness is set up. And honestly, all of it isn't necessarily his fault, but I think he could have did a whole lot of things better. It was clear that he was doing it just for the money. He would try to entice us every single day. Hey, I'm making I, at 25. I was making six figures by selling LA fitness memberships, you know, but what, what he was missing was the element of it worked out for you like that. You know, you're not asking us why exactly you want to be in LA fitness. You're not asking us exactly what exactly we want to get out of the situation. Maybe we want to get in shape. Maybe we want to build a community. Maybe we want to become trainers. Maybe we want to grow within the industry. And it would lead to situations like this in which I would be, let's say I was sitting down trying to sell you an LA fitness membership. The potential client would tell me, look, she needed surgery. And before I could answer, she he's telling her, you don't need to get the surgery. Just sign up for the membership. You don't need to get the surgery as if he's a damn doctor because he just wanted to get this sale so bad you know what i'm saying so to, again like you said there's a difference between people just going to work punching the clock getting their check buying their ferraris or buying their sports car versus an organization that you feel passionate about that you feel a strong push to be a part of it so I, i'll give you the kind of the the flip side now is i just we're recording this on a saturday and i teach at a school and we just had a community event, an absolute, we had an absolute, the first time the school actually put on a community event where there were teachers there. I was there, people there off the clock, weren't getting paid. And the smiles that they had on their faces knowing that, hey, we're serving the community. We're, we're providing something that I could believe in. We're making that 40 hour work week. We're validating it when we see the smiles on these kids' faces, when we see we're improving families. That's how you want your team running. And what I try to teach is to take that feeling. Now, take the mindset of this guy that wants to make a sale because we all got to get paid, but also take the elements of what it feels like to actually be working together. Try to mix the two. Try to figure out how to make those two work together. And then you have a very powerful, powerful organization where people want to come to work and they're getting paid because they that, that relationship to selling isn't like the guy that would you know, sell a membership to someone and tell them they don't need surgery when you have no diagnosis, no x-rays, nothing. You're just going to tell them they need surgery because they don't need surgery because you want a damn LA fitness membership. You could go to your corporate people and say, look what I did. So, yeah, I sold a membership to somebody so they could come in and injure themselves further because, you know, exactly. I have, I have more authority over their physical well-being than a doctor does. Obviously, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it, it was. And this isn't it, the thing is, if you're if you're listening in and you've been in the fitness world, you know, this isn't uncommon. This is what they do. This is what they do. This is not an uncommon practice at all. No, no, it's not. And they they do the whole dog and pony show, walk you around, show you how great everything is, all the perks mm -hmm. and everything else and right. get you a nice free water. And then, uh, yeah, there comes the, there comes the hard pitch right there at the end. There comes the kill. Yep. Come in, come in, baby. <laughs> so you mentioned, you mentioned having a passion for what it mm -hmm. is that you do at your work and having that passion basically be the driver to where you're not coming in and just punching a clock and going home, but you're mm -hmm. actually involved in the mission. Like you're actively engaged and inspired yeah. by it. Now, when it comes to a leader at a business, an entrepreneur, a business owner, hiring someone that can have, or does have that kind of passion, how do you get that done? So you don't have the people that just come in and punch the clock, but the ones that show up like those teachers on a Saturday with smiles yeah. on their faces. How do you get that done as a leader? Yeah. So there's an old saying that is really, really common that my listeners have heard on multiple occasions is they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You cannot. It's just like, you know, talking to a five year old. They don't care where you went to college. They don't care where you what your degrees in, your certifications, your masters. They really don't care about that kind of stuff 
until they know exactly how much you care. All right. So the conversation, let's say you're talking to a potential employee or someone that you're bringing in the staff. Uh, you have to make sure you're emphasizing how much you care about the specific job that you do, what your role is. I care about this school because we're improving literacy rates. We're helping we're helping mothers, single mothers, you know, apply or, or get jobs. We're helping them do this. We're doing something in which we care about the actual cause. Then you start the conversation to see uh, how qualified they are. And then as an owner, then you're able to throw out your stats a little bit. Then you're able to throw out your certifications. Then you're able to say, all right, look, I went to this school. This is what I learned. Let's have a conversation. But it's coming from a place where, hey, that person I'm talking to knows how much I care about them. That's the, that's the only way you're going to get anything out of them. Because if you just go in there and say, hey, I'm qualified to do this because I make six figures. I graduated from this school and I deserve this you will turn people off. Nowadays, I actually just wrote an article about this. Nowadays, everyone can get in touch with everyone. This this allegiance that they may have to a boss is no longer there. They can go on LinkedIn, find whoever they want to work for, message that person. And, you know, they don't necessarily have this. You don't have this authority over people anymore because we're shrinking and we can have conversations with whoever we want. So if you don't show them how much you care, then they talk a second. They're going to they're going to figure out a way to move on. And you would never know it. I can't tell you how many times I've seen teachers literally just work abandoned. Like I'm going on break and see you. Never come back. <laughs> like just go on, like literally say, I'm going on break and never actually show up. Like whether it's fitness, education, athletics. I mean, even in football, there's times where you have guys throw their pads off and just say, I'm not coming back to practice and just be done with it. And it's all a reflection of that leader needing to emphasize to every individual, not just the talented ones, every individual, I care about you. If you show that, I guarantee no one's just going to walk out on you and leave you with a, an open position. If you show them how much you can, you made sure you emphasize that. Mm. So show them how much you care about them as a person, yeah. as well as how much you care about the product or the mission that your, your exactly. business is exactly. involved in. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. So is it in that conversation, I would imagine then it's also important to discuss with that potential employee why they're there or what they hope to get out of this position is that correct yeah, yeah you, you i mean you can't you can't fake it you know when it comes to the caring conversation the why is going to come out it's going to come out regardless like the example i'm thinking of just because we just left this event is the the lady who organized the entire event she has two kids that go to this school and their father is incarcerated so there, her why is very clear. Her What she shows her two kids every single day, how much she cares. And then for her to put on a situation like this where her two kids can say, man, father's incarcerated, but my mother actually got this done. <laughs> that why becomes blaring. It's like, you don't even have to say it. The why is all in the action. The why is like blaring lights, sirens going on. Your why is there. And as you continue to peel these onions back and peel these layers back in people, their why starts to drive them. And, and I got to tell you, Brandon, I know you experienced this as well. When you know your why, ain't no stopping you. You could be you, you could be living out of a damn car. You don't know. When you know your why, man, there is absolutely nothing that is going to stop an individual when they start knowing their why. So, you know, just getting young people on that level of thinking earlier and earlier, it, it's a it's a true blessing when you actually see it come together. Now, do you have anything? I know you're out there as a, as a public speaker and a, an educator. Do you have anything in your arsenal that you put out there to help people discover what their why is? Yes. Yeah, so the the let's say man i can't believe it's been four years now man <laughs> around the uh around the covid time ish area and we all remember what we we're going through during that time i was a trainer at a company named nine round and what i would get i would hear it constantly because as excited as i get as i talk to you these clients these um, members would come in and they would hear the passion every single day like this is every single morning me putting it out there and just motivating them to go through the workout so I went to something called Toastmasters to develop as a public speaker. And I, you know, gave a great speech and all that kind of stuff. And I was getting feedback from these members to say, hey, you got to put out your own book. You got to do your own thing. And when you get feedback like that from the experts, you're like, okay, all right, cool. So 
one of the things, again, just like I always do, I go back to the football world and I was thinking, all right, what can be something that I learned that can stick, that I can talk about and that I can make sure I go to businesses and try to host workshops, keynotes and all that kind of stuff. And I remembered when I played football, they would put us in the three categories, right? It'd be group A, which were the skilled workers, the the wide outs, the running backs, the corners. They're just great athletes in general, skilled workers. So that's S. Then it'd be my position, group B, which is the linebackers, quarterbacks, tight ends. We had, a, had to have a lot of information, well-informed workers. Like the Tom Brady has to be able to throw the ball to a Randy Moss, and he has to be able to throw the ball to a Rob Gronkowski. The information has to be there for the well-informed workers. So that's S, W, I. And then you had your big boys, the, the, the fat guys, you know, the offensive and defensive linemen. You really don't care about them unless they're giving up a sack or they're holding or something happens to the precious Tom Brady, right? So, you know, that's the the linemen and stuff like that. So those are the people that are cleaning the, the glass on the windows, making sure the bathrooms are straight, and you don't complain about those things until you see it dirty. So that's the front team workers. And I had the word swift, skilled, well-informed front team, and I was stuck there for a minute. I was stuck. I'm like, man, swift, I'm going somewhere with this. I don't know where I'm going yet, Brian, but I'm going somewhere. I put people in categories. What's the next phase of this? So per usual, it was around the time college football was going on and the, the great Trevor Lawrence, this is back when he was playing at Clemson, right? And he was a quarterback for Clemson and I was watching him beat Ohio State because I'm a, as a Michigan fan, I always love seeing Ohio State lose. So he, uh, it, was the, uh, it was the Fiesta Bowl in the playoffs and I'll never forget Trevor Lawrence. It drops back, no one's open and he takes off just, I mean, as fast as I think I've ever seen a quarterback with that kind of accuracy. And it hit me. Lift yourself. You have a well-informed guy who's just as fast as a skilled guy, the same way you can have a well-informed manager who can develop the skill to, you know, be a sales guy too. You can have a front team person that decides, okay, look, I'm going to go out and get information. So the, the whole acronym became plus LY, as you see it on my shirt, lift yourself regardless of the actual category you see yourself in, right? So then it got a little deeper because I wrote the book swiftly. And at the end of the book, there's uh, 365 lines in which you can just add, how did you add your LY today? How did you get better today? How did you get better today? And what I try to get, what I do in my workshops with the business owners is I go and I have you assign an employee, assign an accountability partner. Hey, you add the LY to that person that you know is in this category. And then as you do that, you'll start to see, hey, this guy actually cares about me. I can just get one thing done and you'll start to see them kind of working together because I did it. I remember the first workshop I actually did, it was at a massage envy and they were thinking like, maybe I'm all free. Maybe I'm going to help out this young girl who's just, you know, struggling, doesn't know if she wants to go to school or whatever. And, you know, you start to see just in that workshop where they're thinking of ways in which they can get better. And that is very important because, again, a lot of times the, the manager I described at LA Fitness, they're, they're very common out there. They're going to get to a point where they use money to entice people to stay. And when you get that perspective, it gives young people just a little bit more like, look, I want to I want to do something other than just money. Yes, you got to get paid. I'm not telling you not to get paid, but I want to make sure I'm enjoying what I'm doing so I could get paid infinitely. I get paid in my sleep if I do it the right way. So one of the lessons that I, I learned through going through personal development and, you know, becoming a coach later on was that if you're confused about finding your why, you could just ask people that are close to you that know yes. you best. Like, hey, what do you think that I'm good at? Like, mm -hmm. what do you think I could do that could really add value to someone? And then you take those answers and you basically weigh it against your heart. What yeah. resonates with me? What do I agree with? What do I not agree with? And you can kind of right. narrow it down from there. It's sounding like the exercise you're describing when you're having the accountability partner coworker list this, the person's L Y that mm -hmm. you're basically doing kind of the same thing as far yeah. as, you know, what they have confidence in that the person can complete what they can be if they keep going. And, yeah. uh, yeah, that's a great thing. And, and do you find, uh, this is something I'm just curious about while you were, while you were talking, do you ever find that people switch categories after you work with them? Yeah. So what I actually have found is people, there's more people that are look at themselves as all three. 
<laughs> ah, both people okay. think of themselves as skilled, well-informed, and front team. They're like, you know, remember, so what I do is after after I explain it, I usually have them go up and, you know, explain to them what category they're in. And there was one girl who said, look, I'm all three because, look, I graduated from this school, so I have that information. I do have the skill to be a cosmetologist. And again, I'm with, this was a massage envy. I'm willing to go and wipe down all the, the bedding. I'm willing to go out and do that stuff. So when somebody hears that and they consider themselves all three, I'm like, okay, now you're the leader. Now you're someone that can go out and teach a young person this kind of thinking, all right? Because you can mm. be all three people have just never known it. You may just have a boss that focuses on the one element that makes them makes them look good to you. But now that you know you're all three, okay, look, ain't, there's no stopping you now. You're going to take the initiative because you start to know your value. And when you start knowing your value, this is all inner work, guys. I want to make sure I'm clear. When it comes to this stuff, it's all mindset work and it's all you, again, respecting your authority, so to speak, but doing what you have to do to get better for the team and for the organization. This is what you have to do because that person who, quote, unquote, hired you, they got bills to pay too. They got situations where they got to make the best moves for the company. There could be a corporate structure in place right now that comes in and downsides. And next thing you know, you are gone. Look at what happened to ESPN just a year ago. All right. The Disney things are going streaming. You got great commentators that had great personalities, had it all. See ya. You know, you know, because of the way the corporate structure is is, is moving. And I've I've heard Stephen A. Smith say this on multiple occasions is he had to focus on the whole wide scope of things to make sure this is how the money comes in. This is what I got to say. This is the things I can do. I can't just focus on one element of myself if I'm going to make myself better for me, but also if I'm going to make myself better for the organization that's paying me. And again, you're going exactly where I wanted to go next, right. which is the perspective. Because you mm -hmm. talk about how important it is for the employee to understand the perspective of the business owner and know yes. where they're coming from. Now, yeah. go with me here with this for a second. You, your average employee is sitting at their desk, their cubicle, whatever. And if they get exposed to this idea that all of a sudden they need to care about the boss and what's going on with them and why they do what they do, they're going to be sitting there thinking, why should I care about what he has to do? Like, that, he just sits up there in his nice corner office and he's got the nice view and goes out to lunch every day. doesn't talk to me. Like, why do I need to care about what he does? And mm -hmm. so with that kind of thought process, how would you challenge that person to start stepping into that perspective and changing their thinking? All right, so the first thing I'd say is, look, you got to you got to understand. As a as an owner, as a leader, as someone that is put in that position, he or she deals with things you don't have to deal with. All right. There's a lot of stuff you don't know. And I get what you see. I get what you see is them going out to lunch, doing this, doing that. I get all that. All right. But at the same time. You don't know the pressure. You don't know the emails. You don't know the conversations that they're having with whatever higher up they're having. All right. So you as the person, you have to understand just like just like you may have kids and bills and stuff like that that's going on in your life. That person also has that pressure to to uh, receive, get a certain outcome or get certain goals, certain things are certain measurables, I should say. Like if we want to use the example of the L.A. fitness guy. He every day there was a system in place and, you know, the people at LA Fitness can go and look in the system, see who's making appointments, who's making sales, who's doing that. And if the numbers aren't looking good on the system, he gets those calls, calls and now he's on the chopping block. All right. So understand you don't have that kind of pressure where you have to depend on somebody else doing their job in order for you to keep your job. OK, so coming with it from that lens there, you can start to get the empathetic conversation going not to say that you automatically are going to it's not going to happen overnight but not to say you're you're going to at least be moving in the direction where you're somewhat empathetic the same way you may have had it with your parents even myself included when i started quote unquote adulting i would call my mother call my father and just say man we are tough <laughs> you know the the college tuition the bills you have to pay the mortgage the putting the food on the table the amount of things you have to give up as a parent, just so I can make it through the day, that was a, a huge, like, 
eye-opening experience, right? So when you start moving in that empathetic uh, in that empathetic way, then you can start the conversation to say, hey, boss, look, this is what I care about. I have a daughter. I have uh, bills. I have something that I need to, that I really care about. And I want to make sure we're, we don't have to like each other, but I want to make sure we're working together to the point where we at least can work together, be professional. So a job gets done and both of us can find some way, some way in which we can make sure my money is coming in. We're going to make sure our money's coming in, make sure we're enjoying our experience together. All right. So I don't want to simplify this for you guys. It's not an easy process to do it because a lot, like Brian said, you have gotten consumed and the, the school system kind of moves you in a direction where you're sitting down, you're listening to somebody tell you what to do. They tell you to get a job. They tell you to go to college and all that. And they look at you as a success. And, and you know, you start to feel like you're like, man, geez, even with social media now, now your worth, your value and your self-worth is based upon attached to some whatever title or how many likes you have and all that. So it's hard for you to go and look at another person or look at someone that may be cleaning up, kind of cleaning up the bathrooms or wiping down treadmills or wiping down whatever and say, man, I wonder what you actually go through every day. So I'd say to start the process, I know it's a long answer, but to start the process is just understanding what is that boss's day-to-day -day like and go from there. Just go from there. Just figure it out what their day-to-day -day is like. Go from there and have that conversation with them. Very interesting. And I, I think that conversation, it would stem from not only the employee side, but also from the boss's side as well. Mm -hmm. That way there's, there's a mutual understanding of what they do every day and what they have right. to deal with. And I mm -hmm. think this is something very important that uh, Gary V does with all of his employees. And I, I think he said at least at once a year, he sits down with every single employee and has right. a conversation. How's yeah. it going for you? What are you, you know, what are you getting out of this job? Is there any way I can help you do better, be better? Um, you know, yeah. and, and he says all the time, you know, that owners need to understand that, your employees don't work for you. You work for them, mm. which That's I think probably. is a very important, important little turn. It is, it that, is very important. That is very true. Uh, as much as as much work abandonment as I've seen, that is very true. <laughs> I mean, folks can leave <laughs> with the drop of a bat. So that is a very, very uh, strong gem that one of many strong gems that Gary Vee has dropped over yep. the years. <laughs> yep, hundred percent. And speaking of. Gary V and, and mentors, obviously throughout your life, you've had a great many mentors that have stepped in and helped guide you, but mm -hmm. who would you say is the greatest mentor you've had so far and what was their best piece of advice? Oh, uh, that is an easy, clear cut. Number one, you know, not even close anybody, Miss Deborah Brookshank. That's my mother. <laughs> That's my mother. She, uh, she, the best piece of advice she's ever given me was like, look, no matter what you do, son, you always have to prove yourself. Always have to prove yourself. She, her, her career in itself is truly a testament of the per the person that you can actually see just walking around normal, not famous, just taking care of their family, but is an actual hero, an actual living hero that you would never know, would never be on ESPN, would never make news. Okay. So she grew up in grew up in Trinidad and Tobago with four brothers. And she would tell me all the time they grew up in a one bedroom shack, like sleeping on the floor type shit, like just absolutely poor. She moves to Brooklyn, New York back in, I believe it's 70 ish time. You know, and this is Brooklyn, New York. This is where it's a really rough part. And when she got pregnant, I believe with my sister, if I'm not mistaken, it was either my sister or me. No, it was definitely my sister because my sister's five years older. When she got pregnant, she she would tell me all the time, look, I didn't want you guys growing up in Brooklyn. So she moves us to Silver Spring, Maryland, did what she had to do. And she, uh, my, my father too, my father would be a second. But my father had the, you know, he's an architect and he had the degrees, he's going to school and all that. And while he was doing that, my mother was working as a bus driver, bus driver while getting her associate's degree. All right. And then eventually it grew to become now she's head of transportation in the entire post office. And it's been that 
thing that has been able to put me through college, put me and my sister through college. And I, you got to think, I went to a private high school too. So they had to pay for high school. And then my father had a kidney failure. So there was a, we got to get the transplant. So all four years of high school, my father was on dialysis and she had to hold down all this, the mortgage, everything just by being a woman with an associate's degree, just one associate's degree. That's just two years of college. And there's all this work life experience. And one of the things I actually did talk about in my book is there'd be times that we'd go to the grocery store and she would find the money to just buy cookies for her drivers, you know, small things. So she's shopping for her family, but she's also buying little treats for the people that come in. And you know how the post office works. There's uh, there's drivers, transportation, all that kind of stuff. And she would do the smallest thing like that. So when it comes to the mentorship, it's definitely been her giving me that mindset of empathy for your work. You know, you're not just better than anyone else because of what college you went to, because you have some fancy degree. It's going to be all about your work experience and how you touch people that interact with you every single day. That's what I got from her. Mm. That's a great lesson, man. Yes. <laughs> Shout out to your mom, man. That was a great Shout out to mom, lesson. <laughs> <laughs> it was. And that's what gets me is like, I, I've been to four different schools uh, college wise, and you meet so many people in the education world that I'm in. The doctor, this, they, this. I mean, like, y'all have no idea, man. One woman with an associate's degree just shows that she gives a shit and she's just out there doing it, doing it, taking care of the family, doing all that shit, man. Yep. <laughs> And that's what it's all about. Like those little things, like you said, the buy, buying the cookies for the drivers. It is those little things that brighten a person's day that, you know, it, it's more, you know, it's kind of selfish, actually. It makes the person giving feel good to do mm -hmm. it. It's almost like an addiction and it just keeps happening and it just keeps that cycle of goodness going. So I'm yeah. so glad. I've actually heard it. Yeah, I, I've heard it said. I, I can't even remember. I listened to so much of the prof prof professional personal development at this point. I can't remember who the person was. Who was it? But they said being selfish is actually a form of being selfless because of everything you just said. If you're, if you're a selfish person, meaning you want to take it, it's actually a form of being selfless because it's showing people that you're here. Like being selfish can be a, a kind of a way of looking at it, things as a selfless person, because you caring about yourself is showing other people how to operate and how they can, you know, navigate this, this chaotic mess of a world, this chaotic society of a world that we have, you know, we do. It's just, I'm not here complaining. It's just part of the, part of the life school that you are, that you kind of saw that you were born into, man. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. If you, if you want humanity to improve in any aspect it starts with you, you know, whether that yeah. be a, a physical transformation, you know, getting in shape, eating better, um, quitting smoking, quitting drugs, quitting drinking, whatever it is, it right. all starts with you. And yes, a hundred percent, it can inspire so many people that okay. you, you aren't even aware of. Like I had right. this, uh, you know, when I was, um, 19, yeah. When I was 19, believe this mm -hmm. or not, I was 200 pounds and I'm, on, I'm yeah, five. I need, I need some pictures. I need I, some pictures. Yeah. But. Yeah. We're, we're not doing that. I'm five, seven and I was really? 200 pounds. Yeah. Wow. It was college and no physical uh -huh. activity and a bunch of eating and partying, man. And, yeah. uh, it turned out I was pushing, I was pushing diabetic. And, yeah. uh, you know, it came to the point where it was a medical decision. It's like, well, either you're gonna continue and be diabetic or you're mm -hmm. going to change your life and get back under control. And so that's what I did because I was, like, I don't want to be a diabetic that scared the living hell out of me. Yeah. And through that transformation, I inspired a lot of people that were close to me to the point mm -hmm. where one of my friends told me one day that she was going to... <laughs> I laugh every time I think about this. Mm -hmm. She was going to take a bite of like a, a Twinkie or a Ding Dong or something. And, and she heard she heard my voice in the back of her head telling her not to do it. Yeah. She's like, and she's like, sometimes, sometimes I listen. And other times I just say, shut up, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> and it, it, like I said, it came from a place where, look, it's it's serious now. It's time for you to get your health back. And look at how it touch, touches people. That That's an excellent story, man. Being a, a fitness guy, I love hearing stuff like that, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's super cool. And it just again, it goes to show you that no matter who you are, no matter what you do in life, what your job is, you never know who you can positively impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just going back real quick to the um, the coaching side of things and helping people in businesses, you know, one of your key takeaways in your teamwork talk is how to emerge as a leader in a hostile environment. And I wanted to make sure I asked you this, like, what do you mean by a hostile environment? All right. So a hostile environment is an environment in which it could be two things. Okay. It can mean there is pressure. There's pressure on you to do things that you don't necessarily want to do but you know you got to do it as you know to make to get a check and to do the job description or a hostile environment could be where you're not actually utilizing your talents and utilizing the things that you feel like you're good at you just have someone you're just showing up to work every day and it's not it's not connecting so those two environments and that you're either in one of the two most of the time when you're complaining about your job it's either one of the two you're having to do something that you don't feel like is morally correct but you're getting the check or you're not being utilized in the way that you feel like you're utilizing things that you're good at so when when it comes to emerging as a leader just recognize it first things first is recognize it and then okay what can i do to take the initiative to make it so i can do those things all right i'm living proof example of it as a boxing trainer you were not expected to write a book you were not ex i was not expected to go and deliver keynotes you weren't expected to do these things but i knew that that side of me was not being utilized to the best of his ability. like i wasn't getting paid off my thoughts i wasn't getting paid off books or anything like that i was getting paid just to train people and that was it okay go write the books so people can now pay you to do that stuff and you have the boxing trainer background and you can merge both of them and that's how you emerge as leaders in fact there was a i remember actually when i first put it out i was going around to businesses and asking them like be a setup set of vendors and all that and when i first told them about it they thought that the owner wrote the book i'm like no it was me who actually wrote the book right and that's what i want to incorporate to a lot of people out there who are stuck in one of those two places all right you're doing something that's morally incorrect all right let's create something whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's an organization where you're going to do things where you can merge something that's morally correct or you're in a situation where your talents are not utilized what products, what service, what things can you put out there that can potentially even merge with your current job? How can you merge those things so you're emerging as the leadership in that situation, even with the uh, with the community event I went to today? This was not necessarily in her job description to create this community day. But again, two kids that go to school, their father's incarcerated. I need to show my boss or the CEO of the school I can create these things now she's emerging as that leader. I don't want to hear the excuses, guys. Every last one of you have the opportunity to do that. I don't care. If, if I can do it for the people I've talked about on this entire show can do it, you have something you can be doing. The only reason you would not do it, it would not be doing it is because you've gotten too comfortable and you just get it. You're not being pushed out of your comfort zone to actually do the work to get it done. That means, hey, I might not be able to go to happy hour and spend the money on that alcohol because I want to, you know, start this business. I want to get incorporated. I want to trademark this license. I want to maybe spend that money on some merch so I could resell the merch at this event, this, that, and the third, and emerging at that as that leader. That's what's going to lead you to the freedom right there because you don't want to get stuck in that hostile. 80 hours every, or 40 hours a week is a long damn time to be stuck in a situation that you don't want to be in. It adds up. Trust me. It's not, it's not a pretty, not a pretty situation. No, it is not a pretty situation. <laughs> I've, I've been there myself at a, at a job that I knew was dead end. And uh, yeah, we, we won't, <clears throat> we won't go down that rabbit hole because we're running short of time here because this All has right, been such an that. amazing we'll conversation. <laughs> um, so before, before we get into the little outro section here, um, as a guy that has just come into your world, I got to ask, what is the significance of the three pencils? The significance of the what? The three pencils. Oh, yeah. Awesome. All right. So you see it. It's red. Well, it says, I don't know if you can see it, but it says plus L-Y on it. This is one of the logos that 
is a little shorter, but it says plus LY on it. Um, the significance is that it's red, yellow, and blue, the primary colors. And when you take into consideration the plus LY, how you lift yourself and all that, you can make whatever color it is you want with these colors. So you got the plus LY mindset, okay, how I got better. And then the fact that the colors are the main primary colors, I can create whatever color I want. Just like I can create whatever business or whatever opportunity it is I want. And you kind of may merge that those two. I love it. I love yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you for telling us that. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Thanks for asking. People don't ask me that often. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I found I found it a, a little nugget. It kept it kept showing up in different places throughout all your content that I was going through. And like, I gotta find out what's up with these pencils. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, people think I, it's uh, some people just looking at it. They're like, you work at a school. I do, but they think I own a school or own a daycare because it kind of reminds them of some daycare, some school situations. So. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's uh, not that it's all about possibilities. Yes. Yeah. Well, as one, again, this has been an amazing mm -hmm. conversation. I can't thank you enough for all of your stories, the knowledge that you've shared here, your experience, where can people find you and, and just dive deeper into your world or potentially get you to come out and, you know, speak, how, how do they dive in? All right, one-stop shop. It's makeyummove.com. That's M-A-K-E-Y-A-M-O-V-E.com. One-stop shop for all your teamwork, all your self-development needs. It's all there. Um, everything you could really know about me is there. I do have a podcast as well, and I'm pretty sure you're not going to find another as one Crookshank. So pop that into Google search, and all the stuff is going to pop up. So. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Well, the link is going to be there below. Click, go to the website, enjoy, dive in. He's got some great free content there as well. And again, Aswan, thank you so much for coming on, man. It's been an absolute pleasure. Likewise, likewise. Thanks for having me, Brian. Absolutely. All right, guys, you know what to do. Like the show, share the show. You never know whose life you can positively impact with just a simple share. But thank you so much for your time and attention. And peace, I will see you in the next one.